Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to see a show of hands. How many of you have seen Bruce Momjen's talk on nulls? Anybody? One? Do you feel like you understand nulls after... How many of you feel like you understand nulls? A few of you? Okay. Hopefully, hopefully there will be no hands that will go up if I ask this at the end. <laughs> Okay. Put, put, it, put it this way, by the time I'm done here, you will probably understand that you don't understand nulls. <laughs> so this is why this talk is called Everything You Probably Never Wanted to Know About Nulls. Um, we're going to talk about why nulls are confusing. We're going to talk about where they come from. We're going to talk about what a mathematically based null would look like if we had one and why we don't have one. Or actually, we kind of do have them, but not where we think we do. So, about me, um, I have been using Postgres for 25 years. Um, I often come to these conferences, there may be one or two people who have more experience with Postgres than I do, but not very many. Um, I have uh, worked as a database administrator, a software developer, <coughs> a consultant, a... Um, engineering manager of database teams. Um, I've even contributed code to Postgres itself, a uh, small little bug fix uh, for a race condition between parallel plan startup and uh, replication. Um, so that's me. I come to these conferences, I like to speak, and I like to push Postgres in directions that nobody else tends to like to push it. Um, so. First of all, we do have mathematically defined nulls in databases in two pieces, but we never call these nulls. There are exactly two mathematical nulls in databases. The first is a null set. A null set is basically, you can think of it as like an empty table, okay? Um, a null set is a set with zero members, okay? The other, the other mathematically defined null we have is the null tuple. And we're going to come back to this. So the null tuple behaves in ways that defy logic in Postgres and probably in other databases too. Um, the null tuple is like a row with zero fields. Okay? Um, so we have, we have these two things. We don't call them nulls. We call something else a null, which we didn't pull from mathematics. Um, but if we did use mathematically defined nulls, these, was, these are what we would call nulls. However, this guy deserves the credit or the blame. Um, this is Sir Charles Anthony Hoare. Uh, he has called nulls his billion dollar mistake. Uh, null references he was referring to because he was one of the major um, uh, he was one of the major uh, designers of algol languages, right? And in algol, uh, it was a successor to algol 65. One of the things the product people had decided was we need Fortran compatibility, and they're like, but we have all this type checking. We can't really just make it work with something that doesn't have this in the same way, that, that doesn't look at data in, as records in this way. We need to make it work. And so he came up with the idea of a null reference. Not sure what happened there. Null yes, well, evidently, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so at any rate, um, and then this was designed to make this compatibility just work. Now, if you go and you look up his talk about null references being a billion dollar mistake, he actually goes into the fact that there would have been some other ways of doing this. Um, but that this was the way that everybody had just kind of settled it, or that this was the way he did it, and then everybody just kind of settled in on it. Um, and he has said that null references have caused at least a billion dollars, roughly, of damage since the time they were introduced. Now, um, we grabbed nulls from these null references. So I think we need to continue this forward 
And I think if you look at all the trouble that nulls have caused in databases, it's got to be 10 times what it is in application development. <laughs> so we ought to be able to add a zero to, 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 to Tony Hoare's um, estimate of the damage of, of his own um, uh, invention here. So if you've worked with nulls at all, you know this thing called three-value logic. But the basic problem that we have in databases is we built these things from relational math, but then we have to make them work in the real world, right? So we end up saying, okay, well, relational math works in sets, but we, can't, but we have duplicate rec entries. How are we going to deal with this? Let's ditch sets and go to bags. We'll define a new entity called bags to deal with this problem. Um, how do we handle missing information? Oh, let's just throw a null reference in there. We, don't, we didn't have the data, let's, let's, let's throw in a null reference. So we did this. But now, now the problem is people start to go, OK, well, what does this mean? Well, we don't know what it means. So let's say it means unknown. So we end up with three-valued logic. Um, null equal anything is uh, null. Um, But because that doesn't work very well, um, is, we have the is operator for Booleans, right? So is true, is false, is null. This never returns null, right? So null is true, is false. Null is false, is false, right? If null were tr fully unknown, that wouldn't work, right? So we've created these other we've created these other um, we've created these other operators because null doesn't really mean unknown. We just sometimes decide that it means unknown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we all then have uh, to figure out is how to choose the right operator, right? Um, is is not applies to booleans only. Is distinct from is not distinct from applies to any data type. If you can figure out why the SQL standards community decided to do that, you're welcome to explain it to me. I haven't been able to figure it out. Um, and then when you have almost anything else, then you have a null in there. It evaluates to null, right? Um, this is relatively straightforward until we get to more advanced nulls. Because unwilling to stop here, we've decided to add more insanity onto things. So now let's talk about some advanced fun with nulls. So. Um, so, how many of you think that it's possible to store a value that is null in a field that is designated to be not null? Anybody think they can do this? In fact, it's quite possible to do this because, and this starts to get into Postgres internals quite a lot. Um, but I think as we start to understand the problem here, we're going to start to see that, that null is, is null is so heavily overloaded that we can get into situations where things really, really, really don't make sense. So here's a good example. Create type foo, and we're going to have two fields in it, uh, an int and a text. Create another table, we'll call it bar. This will have one field, it'll be a foo type, so it's a composite type. And let's say we don't want nulls in there, so we define it to be not null. So now we insert into bar a foo type where both values are null. Postgres will happily do this for you. Now we realize we have a problem, and we do alter table bar, add check, foo is not null, and we get an error. 
the check constraint fails because the entry we added is null. How does this work? Anybody, if you have any ideas, just, just raise your hand. I just want to see a show of hands. Anybody think they have any idea why this would work? Why this would work? Okay, so <clears throat> to understand this, we have to understand how Postgres actually stores nulls in the background. Okay, the Postgres um, data pages are basically, you have a page header, and then it's basically an onion structure going from the top and the bottom. You have a header going from top to bottom and rows from the bottom to the top, and they meet in the middle, right? In this structure, we want to optimize away the storage of nulls um, because you can't really use, okay, so let me back up a moment. One of the early approaches to storing nulls is what Oracle does. Anybody here have any experience with Oracle's null handling? Okay, so Oracle had this great idea. We have to deal with nulls somehow. Let's store them as impossible values. Okay, so if we have an integer or a number of any sort and we need to store it as a null, we will store it as a negative zero, okay? Because we don't have any other reason to store a negative zero, so a negative zero will be null. Um, anybody want to guess what a null text string is in Oracle? No, nope. yes, well it is an empty, an empty string. <laughs> yes, it's an, uh, so in Oracle, an, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a null, it's an empty, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, it'll store it as a, yeah, exactly. So it's just an empty string. So if you do empty string is null in Oracle, you get true. <laughs> um, this also leads to fun with concatenation handling and a whole bunch of other things. And Oracle, of course, being Oracle, was the first major relational database on the market. They got to make all of these mistakes. And then, of course, people are depending on this behavior and they couldn't fix it, right? They actually kind of fixed it by adding a new data type with different null handling just so they could kind of encourage people to do nvarchar instead of varchar, right? Um, so a lot of people looked at Oracle's implementation and they said, that sucks, because it does, right? Um, and so what Postgres does is in the row header, it actually has a bitmap field which tells you which fields are null, right? And in our example here, is that bitmap field, is that bitmap entry null? No, it's not. The not null, const the not null constraint on a column, if it's not a check constraint, check is different, but just a not null constraint on the, on the column, all it does is it checks to see whether that bitmap bit would be set, okay? So a, um, so an actual, if I were to put null instead of, an M, uh, instead, of a, instead of a row type with both fields being null, then it wouldn't in insert, right? But when I insert this value, it, all, it inserts a new um, tuple header in the field itself and says, okay, this field isn't null, but all fields within the field are null, okay? And then what we do is we alter the table, we add a check constraint, and a check constraint evaluates a SQL expression. So because the empty uh, entry evaluates to null, now the check constraint fails. So now you start to see that if you're using composite types anywhere, Understanding this becomes really important because there is no way to enforce <laughs> on the creation of a type that, um, that, that, an, uh, that a field within that type is uh, not null, right? I actually reported this as a bug back in 8.4, I think, and I was told, can't fix it because if you do that, you will break everything that happens with outer joins. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, an array of nulls is not null. Arrays behave differently than tuples because... <laughs> yes, go ahead. No, you can't. And, and the other thing is that... No. No, no, it gets even worse than that because suppose you go, oh wait, but we can create domains and domains can have a not null constraint to them. It doesn't get, it doesn't get enforced when you're uh, putting it in this way. And that was what I reported in 8.4 and I was told um, this, if you try, because the problem there is that if you have a domain that, um, that can't be null, and you ever query it in a left join, then the return type will still be null, right? So there is no safe place to actually check uh, on type creation that, uh, that the type is actually not null. Go ahead. If the put type here was not compound, if it was a single value, mm -hmm. So the question was, if the foo type was not a composite type, could you still do this with the row? The answer is no, because a row only works for a composite type. So this is, this is the syntax of how you would insert a composite type in, into an insert. So this is, this, is the first, um, this is the first beginnings of, um, of some of the more advanced problems. One of the other problems that, that people run into here, and we're going to talk about a few different variations on this, are anti-joins. Anybody here not familiar with the term anti-join? Okay, I, I, will, I, will, I will explain it. Oh, sorry, I managed to pull off the uh, uh, thing again. It's not, don't worry about it. Um, I'm just going to keep going. Um, at, at any rate, um, now, this is an anti-join. An anti-join, the simplest form of an anti-join is a not in clause, right? We want to select rows from this table where a join condition to this table is not met, okay? That's what an anti-join is. Um, so the simple thing is to use a not in clause. Now, any, uh, I just want to show of hands how many of you understand the problem with, with, with a simple select like this with not, with not in, if you have nulls. Uh, only a few of you have, have probably been bit by this so far. If uh, some vowel in B has any nulls in it, anywhere, this will return exactly zero rolls. It will return a null set. Why? Because not in will treat null as a unknown, and we don't know if this matches or not. So therefore, it might, and we can't return anything. Okay, so this this form is bad. It will bite you, and people usually get bit by this at least once in their database careers. Um, so the minimal fix here is just to do where some val is not null. Go ahead. Okay. Now this kind of, this works, it fixes the proximal problem. But the problem here is that if you standardize on this format, sooner or later you're going to forget that not null is not null, and you're going to go back to the same problem in the first. And the really pernicious part about this is when you test this, you might not have nulls in your data, Later you might, and then suddenly your query breaks and you don't know why. So this is why this particular fix is bad. Um, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. So not exists is a little better, but it has some problems with it. Um, so not exists will basically run this query in what is effectively a lateral join, and then discard cases where um, where the lateral join condition is met. Right. Um, the problem with not exists is a little bit more abstract. 
Not exists is a perfect general tool, but that subquery could be anything, right? And as a result, there is very little um, that you can do to make sure that the planner can effectively um, choose the best plan in this case, right? If you're just doing an anti-join, not exists is difficult for the planner to deal with. I have very rarely seen not exists perform anywhere near as well as I thought it should. So, um, so not exists is better. It's going to get you out of this trap, but it's going to create a whole bunch of performance problems in, in, in the meantime. Go ahead. Um, so, so the problem here is, um, again, this gets treated as a lateral join and a discard, right? So um, whatever is evaluated in that loop, it's hard sometimes for the planner to compose it into the plan. OK? Yes, I have found not exist to usually perform, at least on Postgres, slower than not in. But there's a faster version that I'll get to in a moment. OK? Um, the best approach, uh, sorry, it got rid of the uh, dot, um, uh, a dot star. So that should be select a dot star from a left join b using some val where b is null. This one I usually find performs way better than not is, and it even performs usually better than not in. No, sorry, not exists, and it usually performs better than not in. And the reason is that um, that the left join um, side is much better optimized, and consequently, um, it tends to be a lot easier to uh, compose this uh, on the planner side. Um, it's a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> It's a little bit more, um, how should I put it, <clears throat> uh, verbose. And it's also a little bit more limited. In other words, this only works on anti-joins. You can't do some of the more complex logic you could do with not exists, right? But because it's more limited, the planner can make some better assumptions. So my general recommendation actually is to write anti-joins as left joins where the left side tuple is null. <clears throat> and then it will simply do the left join and it will discard it anywhere that join condition is met. And it will do it as a left join rather than as, um, as a lateral join. So, um, so, this is, so this is sort of the initial piece here. Um, I have a few more examples that I'd like to get to if we don't have questions. Um, are there questions at this point, or, or should I just kind of continue to a few more um, unexpected pieces? OK. At this point, I think I'm going to um, pull up a um, let's see this is probably too small for everybody to see here so let's see it's control shift let's do this okay so <clears throat> since many of you have not seen Bruce's talk anybody I mean, just want to see a show of hands how many of you think Select row parentheses is null will return true. Show of hands. How many people think it'll return false? Show of hands. False people have it. Let's see. Oh, it returned true. How many people here think this will return true? Nobody? How many people think it'll return false? It just feels like a trick <laughs> It returns true also. Uh, the null tuple is both null and not null. <laughs> this is Schrodinger's tuple. And you know, if you understand the rules by how um, 
null tuples get um, get uh, uh, or is null gets evaluated with with a row type, then this actually kind of makes sense. But it also really doesn't, and it's a really good example of the lack of logic behind nulls per se. So, um, <clears throat> so the basic thing is if I do, if I put a comma in here, right? So now I have a two value, I have a tuple with two entries, right? Now we get, what? So, why didn't, Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to just create a type here. Wait. Oh, yeah. As. Just do foo two. It probably is just, I can probably do this. Why is this? Okay, so I, I'm not sure why it's not accepting the comma in here. Oh, you're probably right. No, oh yeah. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna create a type foo two. I should probably clear these up between talks. So, so as we have foo three now, and for for some reason this has worked in the past. I'm really not sure what I'm doing wrong, but um, maybe they finally fixed the bug that you're <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. Because so, so if I just do select this, I still get the same problem. If I still do this, I still get the same problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a second. Yeah, it should be row. Um, I'm probably I'm probably missing something really silly here. Um, pr probably miss uh, miss typing something or so forth. But the the general rule is that a row type is null. If and only if all um, fields are null, right? What if you explicitly start null from null? Oh, you're right. Yeah, there we go. See? So this is now null. <clears throat> and this is now not, and this is not not null, right? So, <clears throat> in the case where we have, um, so in the case where we have a, a null row, right? Um, if if every field is null, then it's then it is uh, null. If any field is not null then it is, what? Yes, but it shouldn't be reporting false on both of these. Should be foo three. Um, See what, what I'm what I'm what I'm noting here is that for some reason it is, um, it is casting, uh, it it is returning. Uh, I know what the problem probably is. Nope. <clears throat> so I'm not I'm not entirely sure why this is one of the things which I find about nulls is I sometimes get blindsided by. Um, 
my behavior. <laughs> um, the rule is supposed to be, as I understood it, that if you have any non-null field, then the row type is not null. But here we're seeing that it is neither null nor not null. <laughs> Hmm? Yes. And now it seems to behave, um, behave as we, we expected before. So now what we're seeing here is that there are values which are neither null nor not null. <laughs> And there are values where if every field is not null, then it is not null, right? So now what you find is that if you have a, if you have a tuple which, is, which has zero fields in it, then it is true that no fields, though that every field is null, and it is also true that every field is not null. Yes, yeah, so, so, so it is null and it is not null. But if we have a field which is, um, but if we have a, uh, a field where, if we have a row type where one piece is null, it seems to evaluate <coughs> not only to, it is not not null, it is also not, it is also not null. Because the row between is null. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, so, so this, is, this is actually a really good example of why I usually um, test almost every uh, weird case of nulls before I demonstrate them, and I seem to have um, missed one of them today, and I actually learned something up here while I was... <laughs> but this is also a really good example of how these rules often don't make sense. Um, <clears throat> So let's see. I, I had, you know, so, so this is actually interesting because if you look at a row where you have uh, both of these as null, right? Then it is null. But if we do. this, an array of nulls is not null. Again, there's no consistency. And the reason why there's no consistency is all null actually means normally is no data here. OK, it is just a null reference. And then when we started to say, OK, let's determine whether something is null or not null, now we have made a mess of things which we are never ever going to be able to get out of. <laughs> yes. Well, if we do uh, an array with uh, this, it will still be false. An array which, it, it, even if I have... Uh, a zero form array is also not null. No, wait. So a zero, a zero member array is also not null. Arrays are only null if they are explicitly null. Any other value is not null. Um, row types have, no, have extremely inconsistent logic and uh, lead you to cases where things may be not null and may also be null in other cases where they may be not not null and at the same time not is null. So this is, uh, th this, these, are, these are pieces which, which really kind of highlight, um, highlight some of the difficulties. Um, again, one of the really cool things you can do here is you can actually leverage this when you're, when you're doing anti-joins like I mentioned before. Um, you can say we only, we only want, um, uh, we only want those cases where where we actually have a match on the uh, 
on the row. But now I'm starting to wonder about that because even though I use that all the time, this, this row handling is, is, is weird and it's not what I expected, so I'm going to actually have to go back and, and double check, so to speak. Um, uh, however, just a second, I wanna see something here. If I do this, So that is still, okay. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to just check this also. May maybe it may be about casting. Nope, I'm, I'm stumped by this. This is, uh, this was, th th this is, uh, th this was not expected for me. Um, so, we've, we've kind of talked about like how nulls are stored and some of these things we've talked about, um, the three valued logic. We've talked about the history and the fact that these are null references that they don't actually necessarily mean anything. Um, are there any questions on this side at this point? I know I'm, I know I'm quite a bit early. I'm trying to think if there are any other um, interesting uh, examples that I can go over. Yeah? What? I have a question. When did you actually use the array type and a ah. collection type? When is it useful besides why can't you just create more columns in a table? So, um, <clears throat> so what, what I usually suggest here is thinking, um, so arrays are useful in one of two specific kinds of cases, okay? <clears throat> the first case is it may be useful to represent a single value as a series of sort of sub-values. So for a, as a completely contrived example, and then I could give a, I'll give a more specific example. It's a completely contrived example. You could break down an IPv4 address into four octets, and so you could store that as four, as, an, as, a, um, uh, as, a, as a four um, member array, right? Um, that sort of thing can be very helpful if you needed to do processing on one piece of it. Um, uh, like if you want to, you know, figure out whether, um, whether something here has one of those members being a particular value. Um, a, a real world case I would give on this would be when I worked um, on a big life sciences database. Um, we would generate something called blast reports. And I'll just give you uh, an example of what a blast report is. Um, BLAST is, I forget, the, I forget what it stood for. I think it was like basic something, uh, basic lateral alignment search tool, I think is what it stood for, right? And the idea is that you have protein sequences, right? Or genetic sequences, and you're looking for similar sections in different um, ones, and there may be offsets and things like that. And so what we would do is we would run the tool that would, that would do these searches, and then we would store like the top 10 results in an array. Um, we could have stored it in a more normalized form, but the problem with doing that is that with the size of the data that we were dealing with, um, storing it in an array just simply made performance a lot better. Um, because it's made performance a lot better because instead of finding rows that might be on different pages, um, you'd get the whole row set once out of a single page. Um, and so that helped a lot in that case. I'm tr um, over time, yeah. Um, so in this particular case, we would, we would 
um, we didn't index the individual en entries. If you wanted to do that, that would be possible, but it would be a lot more difficult. You'd have to probably write a function to extract what you wanted to index out of each entry, turn that into another array, and then you would probably have to take that and um, generate a gin index on that, on the output of that function. So it's possible, but it's, uh, we were, in this case, only looking up the blast reports by ID, um, and, then we were, um, and then we were dealing with um, um, deletion anomalies by, um, by doing a further expansion and, and join out of, out of that to remove things that have been previously deleted. <coughs> where I used it uh, in many places, especially to create like tags. For example, uh, in an e-commerce site, each item had, each product had a bunch of different tags, let's say uh, for a Kendall's e-commerce website. So it was red, mm -hmm. small, uh, six by four, you know, a bunch of different tags and attributes. And that allowed to write a query that was very efficient to find now all the items that have uh, the tags, let's say, red and small, red and voted. So, because it, it is indexable. Yes. So, it, it was very effective, very efficient. Also in blog posts, when you many times put tags on them. So, filtering, when you want to filter the result set according to attributes. Be, because... <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, but because you you know it's four, but if it's tags, you don't know how many tags well, you have. No, I mean, but 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 like with okay, so with the IP example, one of I mean, in actual um, practice, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. But one thing that it would make uh, is that if you were to create, for example, a domain that said that we have four um, entries here, right, then you could create um, functions on the domain that could present it as an IP address that could perhaps do other things to it, right? Um, <clears throat> if you store it in, a, in columns, there are ways to do this with inheritance. They're ugly. Um, but you could still attach functions to the record type to preserve it, to present it however you'd like, right? Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way because Postgres has an IP tables type, no, an IP type. Um, but um, as I say, that, that's a contrived example. Um, uh, it, so again, if you have something that's structured and you need to present it as substructured, um, that's, um, that's a good option. Uh, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that SQL arrays are not like programming arrays in one really important um, respect. And that is that SQL arrays are strictly rectangular, right? So if you have a two-dimensional array in, in, in SQL, it is not like an array in, choose your favorite programming language. It, I think, I think, I'm not sure, I think Fortran arrays may be, <clears throat> may be comparable. <clears throat> but, but I can't think of any other language where arrays are comparable. Um, and what this means is if you have a two-dimensional array, you can't have the first, um, set, uh, the first um, ordinal being four elements and the second ordinal being three. Everyone has to have the same number, right? <clears throat> and what this means is that arrays are actually matrices. So if there's any data you want to, dis you want to store as a matrix, Okay, or you want to model as a matrix, an array is an actually a really good data type for that. Um, an example that I would give that I pushed for in a previous place I worked was that we would get um, uh, uh, financial risk matrices from, uh, from an upstream provider. And that would have been a perfect example to use a SQL array to store just simply because the data type matches what you're getting. And there isn't really a normalization you can do to it, right? Can you give an example um, So it would just typically be like a, um, like a set of, uh, it'd be strictly rectangular, usually a set of, uh, usually like maybe, I wanna say five by five um, 
Um, Matrix? Ma yeah. Um, and I think if I remember right, they would be, um, they would be all floating points. So it'd be like 0 0.2, 0 0.34, 0. Point, you know, such and such. And then this would allow you to look at um, like severity and over time of a particular kind of incident and how it was likely to affect certain kinds of markets, right? Um, and I don't really remember where we got these from, um, but just because the data was like a matrix and then it was processed as a matrix, it would make perfect sense to, to store that as a SQL array. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, but JSON B uh, uh, arrays are not like SQL arrays. Right. So what I needed to do, yeah. I could have done now with JSON B at the time and it wasn't available. Right. So, so, so the thing is, like JSON B arrays are JavaScript arrays, right? They can be completely heterogeneous. They are one-dimensional. And if you, have, if you want to have two dimensionality into them, then what you do is you basically have elements which are also arrays, right? So what this means is you can have a JSON B array that's object, object, array, object, array, object, object, value. Um, and um, so that's, that, that's something where it looks more like our tuple types or record types, than it, but you can't store a you can't store a record type un without any other type information in Postgres, right? Because if you try to do that, then there's nowhere to decode the record header from. So I, I would definitely say JSONB arrays are also useful. Um, there are, they're relatively different from, they're, they're completely different from uh, uh, use cases wise from uh, SQL array. I would say if you're if you're storing actual array data, then I would definitely use a JSON B. Um, if you're wondering where I would probably do that, <clears throat> um, if I'm building, for example, a large log management system, then that data that's coming in may be relatively unstructured, um, and consequently, putting it in uh, in a JSON B object makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, the question is about uh, compression on it, and yes, compression would help also. Although, interestingly enough, when, when I was working in a previous place, the compression on JSONB we could get on a column wasn't anywhere near what we could get on disk if we put it on a compressed file system. So <clears throat> since this was almost exclusively an append-only workload, we just put everything on uh, ZFS, compressed it, and we, that way we could ingest faster data just simply because we could trade CPU cycles for uh, IOPS. Jason B. Uh, now, now I need to say something. Yes. Um, actually, uh, okay, uh, if you want, I can show you I have uh, the ways of converting uh, JSON to uh, like relational normalize and back because uh, there are like, there is one function which converts uh, record set to JSON and back. And most times, all the time, I hear customers are saying that they need JSON because they do not know what type of data they receive. It's usually overrated. In real life, they know what they receive, at least like some things. And um, there, it's more faster and more economical to convert them when you receive it from application uh, to relational and then uh, convert it on the out there again. So if you're interested, I will show you <laughs> because I have it. Uh, are, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I can convince your developers, just ask me. I can convince everybody, right, Omar? Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm just a moderator. <laughs> the question was between choosing JSON-B and just plain JSON-B. Yeah, so, so the question was between choosing JSON-B and plain JSON. Um, this is a slightly different topic, <laughs> but there are, there are actually several cases where I have seen things that are supported in JSON that are not supported in JSONB. And if you're hitting those cases and you don't need the gin indexing, then it makes sense to use JSON uh, 
instead of JSONB. Um, I'll give you just the two top examples that I have off the top of my head. JSON as a specification allows duplicate keys. <laughs> In case you are happening to use duplicate keys, JSONB will not work for you. And having said that, you should not have duplicate keys. You prob probably should not have duplicate keys. If you are using duplicate keys for something where you actually need duplicate keys, then sure. Um, but there's probably better ways of, 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 of doing it than that. The second one is actually a really interesting issue with the internals of how things are stored. JSON, uh, the specification, allows you to do Unicode escapes inside of JSON identifiers and value, uh, strings. JSON B, when you store it, stores actual strings. So if you have embedded null characters, um, which might happen, for example, if you're actually like trying to store actual binary data, then JSONB will not work for you. Yes. So if you do a Unicode ba uh, backslash uh, U, uh, ba uh, yeah, U zero. Uh, you will get an error. Uh, I can probably. I'm trying to remember how this works. Um, I'm trying to remember if this is right. Wait, I don't think that's right. So I think that's the wrong. So let me let me try this again. Select. Might be. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we have this. This will throw an error. <laughs> so yes. Don't do not ask me how I happen to know this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the only way anybody knows this is by stepping on it, right? Unless you just happen to be at this talk and you're going, huh, that's really interesting. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> so, so the fundamental problem here is that uh, the way strings are stored in, uh, in Postgres internally in memory is as null-terminated strings. And so what happens here if it, tries to, if it were to try to convert it is that you would end up with possibly a null termination character inside the middle of your string. And this, is, this then causes a problem, and so the safety is there to keep that from happening. Um, <clears throat> there isn't a way of really handling it unless you want to, uh, um, unless you want to redesign your JSON documents to, for example, store things in base64 encoding or something. But that's generally speaking not the not the not the best way forward. So, um, so th those are the two cases where JSON uh, works and JSON B doesn't. Um, I think I think there is probably a solution. If you want to hear my solution, you will not like it. You can probably guess what it is, and it will not work on, um, on fully managed Postgres instance uh, services, but your only other option is figure out how you actually want to represent this on disk and in memory, and write your own type. Which, the code is, the code is mostly there for you in Postgres. You can copy, paste, and modify. So, but most people aren't gonna wanna do that, so. Uh, can I try the same thing but cast it as text? Uh, yes, because this is a specific aspect in how uh, JSON is supposed to encode Unicode characters. So, yeah, so that's a bit of a digression. But are there any other questions on the null side at this point? I guess not.
Yeah, so if you're using composite types, one more time, if you're using composite types, you want to make sure that you don't have a null type, then you put is, no, you put, you put a check is not null, you don't just rely on the not null in the, uh, um, on the column definition. That, that, that's how you have to handle that, yes. All right. All right, so Chris promised that everybody's going to be stumped by nulls by the end of the talk. I think he kept his promise. Thank you, Chris.